Okay, so the recording started. So good morning, as I've said, uh, my name's Sue Davison. I am a, a senior safeguarding engagement officer with Disclosure and Barring Service. And I'll just go to the full screen so I can see what I'm doing. And um, the objectives of today basically are for you to understand DBS eligibility and safer recruitment. Um, and by doing that, to understand who DBS are and what we do, have a, get a, a, an overview of understanding el eligibility within the education sector and what level of check for the appropriate role. Um, looking at safeguarding issues and how to recognise them and then when to tell DBS and make that quality referral. Um, just to move on. Our purpose and vision um, of DBS, um, obviously the purpose is to protect the public by helping employers making safer recruitment decisions and barring individuals who pose a risk to vulnerable groups from working in those roles. And then uh, our vision is making recruitment safer. So by being a much a visible, trusted and influential organisation, providing uh, outstanding quality of service to all our customers and partners and where our people understand the important safeguarding contributions that they make and feel proud to work with in DBS. So the role of DBS overall, the DBS is responsible for the delivery of disclosure and barring functions on behalf of the government. So this is the legislation that underpins everything we do. Um, we have different pieces of legislation which govern our disclosure functions and our barring functions. As you can see, we operate disclosure functions for England, Wales and the islands under part five of the Police Act. And that's supported by the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1975, Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act 2006, and the Protection of Freedoms Act 2012. We also operate the barring functions for England, Wales and Northern Ireland under Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act 2006, Safeguarding of Vulnerable Groups Northern Ireland Order 2007, and again, the Protection of Freedoms Act 2012. The Protection of Freedoms Act was actually the act that brought together the, um, the disclosure and barring service into one service from CRB and Independent Safeguarding Authority. So as you can see, we have legislation that we have to adhere to and follow. The legislation is set by the Home Office, the Department for Education and the Department of Health. And as you'll also see, um, the disclosure functions um, are not carried out for Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland um, have their own disclosure uh, service and that's called Access Northern Ireland. But we do carry out the barring functions for Northern Ireland. So there is that element. And you'll see Scotland isn't mentioned there because Scotland have its own disclosure and barring service known as uh, Disclosure Scotland, and they carry out their own disclosure and barring functions. So just a brief overview about the partnership and engagement team, the team that I am uh, part of. Um, we're part of the strategy and performance division, and we work across both offices in Liverpool and Darlington. And there are three strands to our uh, team, but we all do work very closely together and support each other. Um, first of all, there's the partnership and partnership management and support team, and that's the strategic side. That's the corporate partnership and the strategic engagement. Then there is the safeguarding engagement team, of which I'm part of, and that's um, responsible for um, national and sector specific engagement. And then a new addition to our team is the regional safeguarding outreach team. So from November 2020, so from November this year, we should have six outreach offices in post. We did have a pilot with the East Midlands and Wales um, up until um, this very present moment, but we've now appointed six outreach workers and they will cover East Midlands, Northern Ireland, Wales, London, the North East and the North West. 
and their purpose is to offer support at a local level. So build relationships, identify regional issues and, tr and trends and acting as the first point of contact for DBS. So just a few facts and figures. Um, as of September 2020, we issued 4.2 million standard and enhanced disclosures per year. Over 90% of those are enhanced checks and around 22% are for volunteer positions. More than 90% of checks contain no information. So we have no information to go by. So we have to go out and get further information on that. We have 1.5 million people subscribed to the update service and we now process around 1.8 million basic disclosures per year. As you can see on the slide, it says 73,000 um, individuals are barred from working with children or adults. The latest figures that we have are um, 77,923 people are included in one or both of the barred lists, so either in the adults or the children's barred list. And actually, on the children's barred list alone, there are 70,673 people actually on that on the children's barred list. So this diagram moving on, this diagram is all about recruitment and um, recruitment as, as DBS, um, our vision statement says, we're, we're all about making recruitment safer. And this diagram is an important element to any organisation. To any organisation getting it, getting it right. Um, so it's important that you as a as a school or as a multi academy trust that you have good recruitment practices in place and dbs checks as this diagram shows can play a part in this process but should not be seen as the only safeguarding measure so if we look at the diagram at starting at the top it says getting the right level of checks at the right time that is the that is paramount to um, any pre-employment check. So clear and comprehensive job descriptions will help you and applicants understand what level of DBS check is allowed. You must have each organisation must have a recruitment of ex-offenders policy in place, which sets out how you will consider any offences that come to light. Then moving on, act swiftly. So act swiftly on the certificate information. So when you get a certificate with information on it, consider how that information relates to the role and to your employment policies. Check ID documents and the right to work, look at employment history and get references to get as full picture of the individual as possible. You can see all the participants. So basically, as we were saying, um, when you get a certificate with the information on, do look at how that role relates to, um, to, to the, your um, employment policy and look at how that role would fit into your organisation. And look at the convictions that have come to light on the certificate. Can you still appoint, employ that person? But we say look at the bigger picture. Um, and ensure that you get a much broader um, aspect and a much bigger picture of, of what the um, offences were in the first place. So then the third circle talks about recognising types of harmful behaviour and conduct. It's important that some, once somebody is in post, you have the correct processes and procedures in place to ensure that you can recognise and act on harmful behaviour. Um, so, uh, recognising the harmful behaviour, ensuring that you have the, the correct processes and procedures in place. Then moving on to four, we, we look at removing the risk. So, having those processes in place that recognise um, harmful behaviour. Also, you need to have processes in place which make it safe and easy for service users or even pupils to disclose information. Um, and that's really essential, as are um, having whistleblowing policies, 
uh, appropriate training and reporting for staff. So for to allow staff to ha recognise how they can uh, report any concerns. But also within schools, you would have a safeguarding lead. So you would need to make it clear to all staff who, you know, that who the safeguarding lead is and the safeguarding lead would be the first appropriate person to, to speak to as, a, as, as well as the head teacher. Keeping accurate records is really vital um, when it comes to taking appropriate action to remove the risk of future harm. And we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later on. But it is vital that you ensure that the accurate records are kept at all times, um, reporting any concerns at all time and that they're followed through. So, um, as I said, it is vital to re ensure that you um, remove the risk of future harm and also ensure that there are no anomalies so that something can't come back to say that a procedure wasn't followed properly. So, um, so obviously keeping accurate records is, is paramount. And then finally, once you've removed that risk, do you then tell DBS? Consider if you would make a referral to DBS. If you have removed somebody from regulated activity, and we'll, I'll explain what regulated activity is, is um, because if you've removed somebody from regulated activity because they've harmed or pose a risk of harm to a vulnerable person, you have a legal duty to report to DBS and we'll see in, a, in future slides what the legal duty is and also I'll explain about what regulated activity is. So um, DBS checks, the, I mentioned before there are several levels of DBS check. We've got basic, standard, enhanced and enhanced with barred list check. The two that would mainly concern you as staff in school are the enhanced and the enhanced with barred list check. And um, to get an enhanced or enhanced with barred list check, you need to be what's called working in regulated activity. And as you can see, the different levels of check show different levels of um, of information. So a basic check is so anybody can get a basic check and anybody can apply for a basic check. A lot of people, such as courier services or so, um, parcel deliveries, they often ask their employers to employees to get a basic check, and an employee can apply for a basic check on their own. Um, we then move on to standard checks, which look at spent and unspent convictions, cautions, reprimands, and warnings. Then enhanced, which show again the spent unspent con convictions, cautions, reprimands, and warnings and also relevant police intelligence. And what that is, is relevant police intelligence is any information that the police deem that the um, employer should know about uh, and also DBS should know about. So if there was no further action taken, but there'd been an allegation made, uh, that, that um, police intelligence would be on that person's certificate. And then finally, enhanced with barred list checks, uh, that shows Again, the spent and unspent convictions, cautions, reprimands and warnings, relevant police intelligence. So the same as the enhanced. But the difference is that we would also check the children or adults barred list to check if the person wasn't already on that barred list. You'll see that the spent and unspent convictions talks about subject to filtering. Some cautions and convictions um, are filtered out from the certificate as they deem not, not suitable. There is some current legislation um, going through Parliament at the moment where there's going to be some changes to the filtering rules. But as I say, this is still to be um, discussed in Parliament and finalised by the Home Office. So also, I shouldn't forget the update service. The update service is um, a really useful tool as part of the, um, the disclosure checks. Um, Organisations and employers can check online free of charge. Um, the update service is available to anybody who is applying for a standard or an enhanced DBS check. And individuals must describe, must must subscribe, not describe, subscribe to the service um, following their um, application for a DBS enhanced or uh, standard check. And 
the um, those making the check will be advised. So an employer can uh, make a check on an employee, and they will be advised that either no new information exists, the original certificate contained no relevant information, new information exists, or there is no record of the certificate in the service. And what that means basically is that when the employer makes that check under the update service, the employer wouldn't be told of what the actual new evidence, new information had was that came to light. Only that there is some new information and that you should then undertake another DBS check on behalf of the employee. So it wouldn't disclose that information, but it would advise the employer that there is additional information that should be noted. Um, every time a check's made, the employee is notified that the check has been made. And it's usually written within the um, employment contract as to how often um, that would be undertaken via the update service. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of organisations do an annual check. Some do six monthly checks, but it's up to, to your you and your organisation and your employment policy as to how often. Uh, you would undertake a check um, with regards to the update service. Some organisations organizations now insist on employees uh, signing up to the update service as soon as they have their disclosure check through. Um, the benefits of the, the update service, obviously you can recheck, as I've said, with the individual's consent. It works out cheaper than a, a three yearly recheck. A lot of organisations um, seem to have a benchmark of checking every three years. Whereas if somebody is moving, either moving from school to school quite often, or the your safeguarding policy, the school safeguarding policy um, wants a, an annual check, then subscribing to the update service avoids that uh, having to go through the whole process again. Um, the disclosure process and um, faster results. That's the other option. That's the other benefit. You know instantly if there is no change uh, to the uh, person's disclosure um, certificate um, and uh, whether you'll know whether a person then find out whether a person, an employee needs to get a new certificate. DBS workforces, we spoke a little bit on the previous slide about DBS checks and you and we talked about um, the children and adults bad list and children and adults workforce. So um, there are three workforces that uh, DBS recognises for checking purposes. The one that will clearly, um, that, that clearly is within your remit is the child workforce and a child under DBS legislation is a person who has not yet reached the age of 18. So um, anybody under the age of 18 is deemed as a child for DBS purposes and if when a DBS um, enhanced with Bardless certificate is sent in from a school, that would be uh, for the child workforce only. It wouldn't be for the adult workforce because obviously teachers, um, anybody employed within the school will be working with children under the age of 18. So this is a really good tool, I think, for um, looking at what, um, what regulated activity is. So this helps you decide if an activity or a, a, an employment role is classed as regulated activity. And it looks at the uh, what the person does, how often it's done, um, and 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 what what the actual role is itself. Um, as you'll see, uh, the top two are providing health care and providing personal care, and this only needs to be done once. The one that is relevant to yourselves working in schools uh, is, is the next two lines, the teaching, training and instruction unsupervised or the caring for or supervised, supervising unsupervised. And this has to be done more than three days in a 30 day period. If it is any less than that, then it's not regulated activity. And so the person would not be eligible for an enhanced with bad list check, they would be eligible for an enhanced check only. So being in regulated activity ensures that that person will be able to have or will be subject to 
and enhanced with barred list check. And as you saw from the chart earlier, the difference between the enhanced and the enhanced with barred list check is there isn't that vast amount of difference other than the enhanced with barred list check checks the um, children's workforce and the adults workforce barred lists. So there are other um, other um, activities there, providing advice or guidance on physical, emotional, educational well-being. There may be some you might have some employees in school who provide that driving children under arrangement. Again, that has to be more than three days in a 30 day period and moderating an online chat room. Um, again, I whether that's a role within school is is uh, although within this day and age it may be with um obviously with the uh, restrictions that we have at the moment and um and ch some children being taught online so what if i mean obviously there are a specific very specific um acti activities very specific roles there um where somebody comes under regulated activity but sometimes there can be um, people who do not meet the criteria for what they do. So then you've got to consider where they work. And that's where specified establishments come into play. This is all part of the legislation still. So um, if somebody doesn't meet the criteria for what they do, you need to consider where they work. And the places are set out in legislation because of their purpose in relation to children. So. As I've said before, individuals working in these places may not be carrying out the previous activities listed on the previous slides, but they must satisfy all of the rules to be considered within regulated activity. So as you can see there, clearly it says where the activity takes place, schools, nurseries, children's centres, childcare premises, children's hospitals in Wales and detention centres for children. Where it says schools, it includes pupil referral units and alternative provision academies. So individuals must satisfy all of the following criteria to be classed as being in regulated activity under the establishment rule. So they need to be working there for more than three days in a 30 day period or overnight between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. They need to have con opportunity for contact with children within the establishment and they need to work there for the purpose of the establishment and they need to ensure that it's not a temporary or occasional role so less than three days in a 30-day period and or it's a supervised volunteer role so an example a good example of this is um, a full-time school caretaker will be in regulated activity if they have the opportunity for contact with pupils even though they don't work directly with them so they work in a school they have the opportunity for contact with children in the establishment. They work for the purpose of the establishment, but they haven't been identified in the um, in the defined roles on the previous slide. So we looked at regulated activity. So we understand a little bit about hopefully we understand what is deemed to be regulated activity and what roles um, are within regulated activity. An employer, so a regulated activity provider, so a school is classed as a regulated activity provider because you provide those members of staff who were all work in regulated activity. So you have a legal duty to refer to DBS um, as a regulated activity provider. So the other um, other employers that the personnel supply, suppliers also have a regular have a, a duty to refer um, as an employment business and also who employ people who undertake regulated activity. The duty to refer does apply even when a report is made being made to another body such as a local authority safeguarding team. As a regulated activity provider, it is your legal duty to make a referral to the DBS in relation to uh, that person, even if the um, the local authority has also made a referral, the school or the um, regulated activity provider has to um, has to has a duty to make a referral. We do say that um, anybody can make a referral and we will consider um, 
even if you don't feel that the duty has been met, the two conditions have been met, we do accept um, any referrals. So when must you refer? So we've said, you know, you, you have a duty to refer, but when you must you refer? So as a regulated activity provider, as a school, you must refer when two main conditions have been met. So the first condition is you withdraw the person to, from engaging within regulated activity. So that person is part of dismissal proceedings. They've been redeployed to another area of the school where they won't be working in regulated activity. Before a disciplinary hearing has been undertaken, they've retired, they've applied for redundancy or they've resigned. What we would say at this stage is still do continue with the disciplinary hearing and record everything and obviously let the uh, person um, even though they've left the uh, school, let them know that the outcome of the disciplinary hearing. And the second condition is where you think the person has engaged in relevant conduct, satisfied the harm test or received a caution or conviction or been convicted for a relevant offence. And relevant conduct, what that means is relevant conduct is conduct that endangers a child or is likely to endanger a child. And then if repeated against or in relation to a child, would endanger the child to be likely to endanger the child. Involves sexual material relating to children, including possession of such material. Involves sexually explicit images depicting violence against human beings or is of a sexual nature involving a child or adult. So where there is where relevant con conduct, um, where that person has been engaged in relevant conduct. The harm test is a little bit different. Um, when we say satisfied the harm test, by this we mean that where behaviour where there is no evidence of relevant conduct, but there is sufficient and compelling evidence of risk of harm to a vulnerable person. So not everything needs to be an action. And sometimes people can express thoughts and feelings which, if acted upon, would cause somebody to be put at risk of harm. And that's what we call the harm test. And an example of that is if somebody disclosed to a colleague that they were having thoughts of a sexual nature about children in their care, this would be considered by DBS as a risk of potential future harm. So that's satisfying the harm test. So we're now going to um, play a video. I hope you can hear it. Um, and uh, it has got subtitles otherwise. And uh, it just I'll just let I'll just play it and then you, we can have a quick discussion about it afterwards.
Hello. Um, I understand some of you couldn't actually see the video there. Could you hear it? No. No. Could could none of you hear it? Could could any of you could you still see it? No. No. Well, oh dear. Oh well. I'm sorry about that. Um. Hopefully, what I'll do is I'll go over it briefly. Um. What it is is a scenario regarding Mr. Green, a secondary school music teacher, who had been a secondary school music teacher for approximately twenty years. Can you still see my screen now? Can everybody see the screen? No? Okay. Can anybody hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So basically the uh, sliding door scenario was Mr. Green, who was a secondary school music teacher for approximately 20 years. He did have a historic indecent assault conviction on his DBS check. However, there was no police information to indicate the circumstances. So at the time of appointment, Mr. Green explained to the school that he was 17 years of age when the conviction occurred and the incident involved his girlfriend at the time, who was 15. So the school employed Mr. Green. So whilst teaching, Mr. Green was found to be friends with several students on social media and evidence was found that Mr. Green had sent an inappropriate sexual joke to a couple of the students. Mr. Green received a written warning from the school and was advised to maintain professional boundaries with the students. Then the following year, Mr. Green was found to be arranging meetings with students outside of school hours and not on school property. One child raised concerns with their older sister who then reported this to the school and an investigation was carried out and found that Mr Green was acting inappropriately with students, crossing professional boundaries by meeting students outside of school, hugging students, comforting students and texting them. Mr Green advised the school that the students were having trouble at home and he was acting as an emotional support as they came to him. He now understands why his behaviour was inappropriate and Mr Green resigned. No DBS referral was received from the school. Mr Green then later applied for a role at a charity which supported vulnerable adults and children. His DBS came back and Mr Green provided the charity with the same circumstances regarding his conviction that he provided to the school. So that one where he said that it was he was 17 at the time and his girlfriend was 15 at the time. So that was still on his certificate, um, but he explained the circumstances. So Mr Green was employed. During his employment, Mr Green built a strong relationship with a 13-year-old female, which then resulted in sexual activity. The female trusted Mr Green. The child told her friend about this and they reported this to the charity. Mr Green was reported to the police and the child suffered from sexual harm and significant emotional harm as Mr Green was her tr trusted adult. A referral was then made to DBS and he was included within the children's barred list. So there's a few things to consider there, isn't there? Mr. Green did have a conviction on his record. Should this affect an employer's decision to recruit? Um, obviously, the importance of a recruitment of ex-offenders policy um, is very important and self-declaration, but it's also about how DBS checks can only play a small part um, in the role of safe recruitment. As I said to you earlier, looking at the bigger picture, risk assessments should be carried out, responding to disclosure information considerations, obviously checking if they're barred, look at the age of the time that the offence was committed and the seriousness, no, seriousness of the offence, look at any pattern of behaviour um, and look at all the circumstances surrounding um, offending behaviour or evidence of rehabilitation and clearly when the um, 
when the voluntary organisation, the charity organisation employed Mr Green, it didn't do that. It did just took his word for the explanation with regards to his certificate. Um, but so it didn't look look at, look further into um, any background as to why Mr Green suddenly left the school. So um, when we look at it from when Mr Green left the school, Mr Green resigned from the school prior to um, any disciplinary action being taken against him. So the school wouldn't have a record of that. So the school would maybe not think to make a referral. So this is where we're saying it's so important um, as a regulated activity provider to still carry out a discipline, disciplinary procedure, even if that person resigns beforehand, and then let that person know the outcome of the disciplinary procedure, and then report it to DBS, send in that referral. Make sure you send in that referral, because sending in that referral could then have placed Mr Green on the barred list earlier and prevented him from causing emotional harm to that young person within the... Um, within the voluntary uh, charity sector that he went to on to work for because there was no evidence for the the employer had no evidence other than his explanation for um, his caution conviction back in way back when he was 17 and they took their his word for it the you know they um, the, there was nothing to stop him from continuing to work with children so it's really important we can't stress the importance really of ensuring that you do send in um, a, a barring referral even if you don't think that the um, as I said earlier even if you don't think that you the two conditions have been fully met even if you think it only part of that condition has been met then we would still accept the referral we can do some um, digging to find further information but we will also we all we always have a legal duty to look at any referral that comes in from any organisation. So when we talk about referrals, what does a quality referral look like? It's really vital that you understand when you should refer to DBS, both in terms of recognising the instances where a referral is appropriate um, and uh, knowing when you have sufficient information. So. You've got to balance, it's got to be timely. You've got to balance the need for a swift response to, uh, with the need for sufficient sufficient documentary supporting evidence. And like I said, with the Mr. Green scenario, we looked at uh, obviously the disciplinary hearing didn't take place because he resigned beforehand. But we are saying, you know, continue with that disciplinary proceedings, disciplinary proceedings. And if it's found that disciplinary actions to take place against him, obviously record that and then let him know what the outcome of it is but also make that referral if uh, if you deem it's appropriate so knowing when you have sufficient information to make that referral is important there's a balance to make to be made between making sure you have enough information and to give us and the risk that exists while you process that information so if in doubt, you can always contact us for advice. If you're not sure about making that referral, um, our outreach workers, our outreach officers are always there to offer you that further advice with regards to completing a referral form. And these are some of the things that we would like you to include in your referral where possible. If you don't have access to all of the information, tell us who has and we will ask them for it and if we don't tell if you don't tell us about it we don't know it exists so accurate and fully completed referral form recognition of any gaps so recognizing advising us of any gaps if if there are any a chronology a full chronology of detailed sequence of events from initial notification to the final outcome all relevant information so that we can facilitate the DBS decision making process if you don't know um, who may have that if, if you don't have that relevant information yourself if you know the person or the re appropriate person to refer to even if you put that on the application form to let us know who the appropriate person would be to provide us with more um, more information training and supervision records they're really important so that we can look at to see whether 
say in Mr. Green's scenario, whether he had some safeguarding training and, and he was made aware, because obviously that something had been picked up earlier about his um, approach with students. Had any appropriate training been given to Mr. Green in that scenario? So accurate dated training and supervision records, and then all the internal and external investigative and disciplinary processes. So including uh, interviews, police intervention, and any multi-agency meetings. So also include recruitment and any additional employment information. So like with Mr. Green's um, scenario, any previous mi misconduct or any complaints. So we do have a, a referral leaflet and there is a link on, um, on, this, on this PowerPoint, but I will send it to you. Uh, the links to um, about making a quality referral and it gives you a bit, little bit more detail. But as I say, do get in touch if you if there is one in your region that you work, do get in touch with the outreach um, outreach worker and they can provide you with additional support and advice. So you sent your referral in. So what does the typical barring decision making process look like? As you can see, as I'm clicking through here, it's a five stage process. So it's not an instant decision that we make. We do make a careful and considered um, decision as to whether to bar anybody to check whether it's it's appropriate, um, proportionate and appropriate at the time. So stage one is we, we have to look at his initial case assessment and we have to check whether that person is working within regulated activity with children. Um, and then look at relevant conduct and we just look to see if relevant conduct has, has occurred or and that person is working in regulated activity. Stage two looks a little bit further about what the information that, um, tells us. Are there any allegations that can be proven on what's called a balance of probability? Um, is it appropriate to progress the case further? Stage three, we look at is there a risk of harm in the future? So future harm, is there a potential risk of future harm? Would a barring decision there be, be a proportionate response to that risk? And then stage four is representation. So representations from the referred person. So the person that's been referred um, is allowed to make representations. Um, and they, that's over a period. They have eight weeks and two days to make representations. And as you can see at the side, there are cases can be closed at any stage. So if stage one, we didn't think it should be progressed further, it would be closed. The representations, um, that's when um, a referral is sent in from yourselves as a regulated activity provider. Sometimes courts, the courts will for, send us in details of relevant offences that they think somebody should be barred from. Uh, working with children or vulnerable adults and we'll consider that and depending on the level of conviction or the caution they uh, will be allowed to either make representations if it is if the conviction is so severe that it's usually straight to be considered for auto bar. Um, they also have a chance to uh, have a review after a minimum barring period and also they can appeal to the upper tribunal within 90 days of the barring decision being made and the appeals can only be made on the grounds that DBS has made a mistake either on any point of law or any finding of fact and um, as I said the, with regards to reviews the DBS has the power to review uh, somebody on the barred list being on the barred list at any time provided that new information has come to light or there's been a change in circumstances of the bad individual or there has been an error made by DBS. The minimum part barring period that we have is for under 18s it is one year and then there can be that a review can take place. 18 to 25 year 25 years old it's five years before a review can take place and then if they're over 25 10 years before a review can take place so the impact of being barred from regulated activity so somebody's barred what happens if somebody's placed on one or both of the barred lists 
I think we've jumped there. Yeah. So um, what are the consequences? So if you place on the children's barred list, you're not in, allowed to engage in regulated activity with children in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And also, if you place on the adults barred list the same, you're not oh, allowed hello to. Hello there. And um, this is Sarah Payne. I had a missed call from you for my about my Mazda. Oh, was it MOT? Hello. Sorry, we've been recorded here. We can hear you, you talking. OK, so um, adults barred list, um, not allowed to engage in regulated activity with uh, vulnerable adults in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. It is a criminal offence to work, seek work or offer to work in regulated activity when you are barred on the relevant list. And it's a criminal offence for a person to uh, permit an individual they know or have reason to believe is barred from regulated... Um, it came in for an MOT on Friday, uh, sorry, on regulated Saturday activity, morning. To engage um, in regulated activity. And it needed activity. rear brake pads to pass the MOT, but um, it was too late in the day to, to do it. So I had to leave it with you for Monday. Sorry, I'm just sorry about this. Can okay, so um, so if it's an employer, you know knowingly employ somebody, the maximum penalty uh, can be five years imprisonment or a fine, um, and the bar also applies to regulated work in Scotland. So if you barred it in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, you cannot carry out regulated work in Scotland, and as I've said, if you if a person knowingly is on the barred list and they try to work, again, the maximum penalty can be five years imprisonment or a fine. Um, I spoke about eligibility guidance. There's, there's, these are some useful links that you might want to refer to that cover a little bit more in detail um, the uh, information that we've talked about today. And well, I've also got some contact details there for my team partnership and engagement and then the regional outreach workers. So if you do have any further questions or you want to um, want to contact the regional outreach workers for um, who work within your area, uh, then do contact them. If the, we haven't got a regional outreach worker in your area as yet, do contact uh, the partnership and engagement team and obviously we will help as much as we can. Um, as I've said, the regional outreach is for Wales, Northern Ireland, East Midlands, London, North East and North West. We are hoping by the end of the financial year, so before March of next year, to have another five um, outreach workers in place. So, as I've said, I will send out links, um, a copy of the links to the um, to this presentation. I'll send that with the uh, presentation recording so thank you very much for listening does anybody have any questions no have I blinded you all with science <laughs> hopefully I've given offered you a high level overview of DBS um, and we will be providing hopefully um, some more information um, with ISBL um, on on more on on dbs so ho hopefully it uh, but if you do have any questions um do contact us via the um the emails that i've provided you with and also that we have a link to survey monkey which will offer us some valuable feedback from yourselves with regards to the um to how the presentation went today and how we could make potentially make improvements. I know the IT hasn't been actually, hasn't been brilliant, but hopefully you will have gained some um, insight into DBS and some valuable information today. So um, that's it. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for listening. And um, 